Intellectual and Manual Labor, a Critique of Epistemology by Alfred Sonrethel. This is chapter 28 to 33. So chapter 28, the foundation of flow production. In keeping with Marxian thinking, we have interpreted the increase in labor productivity as occurring concurrently with increased association of labor. But it is clearly not the time in motion study as instituted by Taylor, which socializes labor. The most striking and best known examples of Taylor's work, famous from his own writings, refer to operations of building workers and to simple loading tasks in a yard of the Bethlehem Steel Company. Not only were these loading operations done by hand with shovels, but they had been done collectively as gang labor before Taylor individualized them. Indeed, one of the essentials in his instructions on time and motion study reads that each analysis must be applied to the operation concerned in strict isolation. This ruling would make it quite immaterial whether the operation studied was done singly or as part of coordinated labor. The relevance of Taylorism to highly socialized production is not that the specific form of labor it imposes either causes the socialization nor presumes its previous existence. It lies in the fact that Taylorism serves to implement the specific economy of time inherent in monopoly capitalism, and the economy of time ensues from high overhead costs and the need for continuous production. The classical example best suited for illustrating this relationship is Ford's foundation of his motor works on the basis of flow production from 1913 onwards. In the building up of the operation, Taylorism played no part. The stopwatch need hardly have been invented, it seems, from the description Henry Ford himself gives in My Life and Work. The decisive element was the organization of mass production of a uniform product. He left much room for the inventiveness of his workers, and the scheme did not develop at one stroke, but evolved piecemeal, always following the logic of continuous mass production. <clears throat> Ford's idea was to concentrate on one model car, his Model T, designed by him personally for simplicity of operation, ease of repair, lightness of weight, and multiplicity of use. He was the first to anticipate that the market for cars was unlimited, providing that the price could be kept at a lower level than anyone at the time thought possible. Other manufacturers were designing individual cars with a variety of models at high prices, aimed at a restricted market for use as a privilege by the rich. Ford's famous remark illustrates his way of thinking. Any customer can have a car painted any color that he wants so long as it is black. Incidentally, he was also the first to realize the value of the uniformity of a product acting as its own advertisement. In the building up of his production process, overhead cost was not a compelling factor. The relation was the reverse. The overheads and their increasing dominance resulted from the flow methods applied in creating this new and revolutionary type of mechanized mass production. The application of Taylorism became a necessity, apparently even to Ford's personal dislike, but indispensable if he was to maintain his profits and his competitiveness. Thus, it is not sufficient to look from the viewpoint of the engineer, only at the history of flow production and capitalism since the Industrial Revolution and the growth of large-scale industry. True, seen from a purely technological angle, no more than a replacement of multi-purpose by single-purpose machine tools, is needed for introducing some measure of flow production. There is no reason why this should not have happened as far as the beginning of the 19th century or still earlier if the product was simple enough and the demand for it sufficiently large and pressing. Emergencies arising from war were the most likely occasions, such as the sudden mass requirements for small arms in the American Civil War. Mass production on a flow method basis appeared as the only device which could supply demands quickly. The need for munitions in the First World War created similar conditions on a much larger scale, but does the technological similarity place these instances on the same level with the Ford works of Detroit? The difference should be easy to recognize. 
The instances prior to the emergence of monopoly capitalism were motivated by reasons of use value and the urgency of wartime need, whereas 20th century flow production follows the logic of exchange value and a time economy enforced by heavy overheads. Thus, the serial small arms manufacture of the 1860s went out of existence and was forgotten as soon as the Civil War was over, while Henry Ford's initiative introduced a new epoch of the capitalist mode of production. Chapter 29, The Unity of Measurement of Man and Machine. The flow method of manufacture is the mode of production most perfectly adapted to the demands of the economy of time and monopoly capital. The entirety of a workshop or factory is integrated into one continuous process in the service of the rule of speed. We remember Marx saying, the collective working machine becomes all the more perfect the more the process as a whole becomes a continuous one. This continuity is now implemented by a machine, a conveyor belt, or other transfer mechanism, subjecting to the set speed the action of all the productive machinery and the human labor serving it. The identical rhythm of time of the transfer mechanism and the unity of measurement it imposes between the men and machines constitute the distinguishing principle of the flow method of modern mass production. Compound machinery with compound labor works under this unity of measurement. Linked by the action of a transfer mechanism, the workers operate like one comprehensive functional laborer using perhaps 400, 800, or 2,000 hands and feet of individuals doing minutely fragmented jobs of work. The mechanized form of mass production is a system in which human labor is coerced into complete technological combination. Clearly, industrial plants organized on principles of continuous flow must follow their own rules of development. Strict, strict synchronization of all part processes is essential. Any section slower than the others acts as a bottleneck, condemning the capital invested in the plant to wasteful utilization. Further, capital must be invested until the plant satisfies the rule of even flow. The result will be the growth of the actual volume of output and the permanent capacity of the plant. This result may or may not be intended nor called for in terms of market demands. If not, the firm stands to lose in the market what it gains by observing the laws of internal plant economy. Here we notice the gap which opens up in monopoly capitalism between market economy and plant economy. For the laws determining the structure and evolution of the production process of monopoly capital are rooted in its intrinsic time economy and relate directly to the labor process of production. But these laws exist, of course, side by side with and in the framework of market economy. Otherwise, the enormous advance in labor productivity and surplus production springing from the new methods would not transmit themselves into private profits. The unity of measurement of machinery in labor introduces a new setting for the class struggle in the labor process. The unity of measurement can either be one of, the one of the subordination of labor to the machinery, or it can take the shape of the subordination of the machinery to labor. It must be one of the two. It cannot remain indifferent to this alternative. Under capitalist management, of course, the first is taken for granted. The assumption being that the workers, while working as a combined force with their hands, in their minds remain divided in conformity with their pay, pay packets. For the contrary case to become possible, the minds of the workers should be set in conformity with the compound character of their combined labor. An example of this rare possibility was shown by the workers at the Pirelli strike in Italy in 1968, when they did their own timing by counter norms and succeeded in taking the assembly lines out of the hands of the management into their own and reduced the flow to as low as 30% of the rated speed. This and many strikes of a similar kind, as well as numerous factory occupations in Italy, France, England, and elsewhere, illustrate the fact that the fetishism observed by Marx involving the inversion of the relationship between labor and capital has worn thin in a type of production where both labor and machinery assume compound structure. Capital continuously faces the necessity for restructuring its production process, not only to reduce unit costs and to elude recessions, 
but even more compellingly to retain its hold over the class struggle. Thus, the present drive towards group work to replace the rigid linear pattern of assembly work may be apparent concessions to the workers, but in fact are nearly always aimed at breaking the bargaining power which the working class have learned to exert from line work. Another response of capital to industrial strife is continuous rationalization of production by having less and less workers and more and more automation, regardless of the long-term perils of this trend. Chapter 30. The Dual Economics of Monopoly Capitalism The system of monopoly capitalism is marked by a duality of economics, the one located in the market and going back to roots as old as commodity production itself, the other peculiar to the most recent form of production and pointing to the latest, if not the last, stage of capitalism. But the rules of the market are no longer the same as in free market capitalism. In the free market, system production was, as a rule, tied to the manufacture of reproductive values, that is, to values serving the reproduction process of society, and these values were represented by marketable goods. The reproduction of capital thus ran, by and large, parallel to that of society, although submitting it to the wasteful vicissitudes of the trade cycle. By the manipulation of the market characteristic of monopolism, this functional tie-up between production and circulation has been increasingly weakened. Monopolistic production is no longer bound to the manufacture of reproductive values, and the consolidation of monopolism in the middle 90s of the last century was marked by the beginning of an arms race leading up to the First World War. Obviously, an ever-growing part of the gross national product consisted of non-marketable goods for which the state devolved the cost upon the shoulders of the population, while the private profits went to the manufacturers. Right from the start, the state enabled the capitalists to satisfy the exigencies of limitless production on the part of the time economy by providing extensions to the limited markets. With the creation of the flow methods of mechanized mass production during the First World War, and with its post-war integration into the capitalist system on a worldwide scale, the duality of market and plant economy became a permanent feature of world monopoly capitalism. It led to the big slump of the 1930s when both economics or both economies broke apart to such an extent that the capitalist system itself was threatened. Only Hitler Germany's wholehearted adoption of production of non-marketable goods and rearming for the Second World War helped world capitalism off the rock by the international arms race. <clears throat> After the Second World War, there was greater awareness on the part of big, big business of the contradictions bound up with this form of mass production and threatening a re relapse into pre-war conditions. The large corporations evolved a planning strategy centered on a break-even point as a guidance for balancing the centrifugal tendencies of production against the centripetal tentacles of the market limitations. <clears throat> Still, without the Korean War in the 50s and the Vietnam War of the 60s and 70s, underpinned by the secular inflation, it is more than doubtful that the recurrence of worldwide economic crisis could have been put off until the later 70s. This brief outline of events serves to emphasize the ever-deepening contradictions of the dual economies, which are of the dual economics, which are basic to the nature of monopoly capitalism, and which help to explain the increasingly damaging effects of capitalism on society. While the regulatives of the market economy are weakened by manipulation, the growing pressures for continuous production and the time economy of cap capacity utilization became the overall leading forces of capitalist development. Market economy fundamental to commodity production must be retained if capitalism is to survive. I lost my place. And production economy must be made to exist within the market economy. But these limitations which capitalism must impose upon plant economy for its own continuation should not stop us from analyzing the formal structure of production and of Taylorism. 
So far, we have viewed this new economy only as a part of capitalism in its third stage. Yet it might harbor potentialities which could assume a vital significance if society were no longer subservient to capitalism. This in no way implies a belief that capitalism is already in its state of transition towards such a future, nor that there is any innate necessity for a final breakdown, other than by its revolutionary overthrow. Nevertheless, we might remember Marx's remarks in Grundrisse. But within bourgeois society, the society that rests on exchange value, there arise relations of circulation as well as of production, which are so many minds to explode it. A mass of antithetic forms of the social unity, whose antithetic character can never be abolished through quiet metamorphosis. On the other hand, if we did not find concealed in society as it is the material conditions of production and the corresponding relations of exchange prerequisite for a classless society, then all attempts to explode it would be quixotic. We have retracted the basic roots of commodity production to the separation between labor and societization, social synthesis, which occurred under the impact of the developing technology of the Iron Age. Capitalism is at the, is at the same time the result and the promoter of a re-socialization of labor. In our belief, monopoly capitalism marks the highest stage of re-socialization of labor in its state of dependency upon capital. Chapter 31, the necessity for a commensuration of labor. We must now turn to the fundamentals of man's historical existence as a social being. These fundamentals are nowhere stated more convincingly nor more concisely than in a famous letter of Marx to Kugelman dated July 11th, 1868, shortly after the first appearance of volume one of Capital, when Marx was irked by the lack of comprehension of one of its reviewers. The unfortunate fellow does not see that, even if there were no chapter on value in my book, the analysis of the real relationships which I give would contain the proof and demonstration of the real value relation. The nonsense about the necessity of proving the concept of value arises from complete ignorance both of the subject dealt with and of the method of science. Every child knows <clears throat> Every child knows too that the mass of products corresponding to the different needs require different and quantitatively determined masses of the total labor of society. That this necessity of distributing social labor in definite proportions cannot be done away with by the particular form of social production, but can only change the form it assumes is self-evident. No natural laws can be done away with. What can change in changing historical circumstances is the form in which these laws operate, and the form in which this proportional division of labor operates in a state of society where the interconnection of social labor is manifested in the private exchange of the individual products of labor is precisely the exchange value of these products. The natural law that animals are subjected to is comprised in the ecology and the biology of the species and for them involves no historical exchange, or no historical change. In application to human existence, the same necessity is converted to economic law owing to the labor by which man provided for his livelihood, thereby achieving his assimilation to nature by his own doing. Human labor is subjected to changing historical circumstance through the changing scope of his productive forces in, the, in this struggle for assimilation. To him, the observance of the economy of this struggle is his law of nature, and the apportioning of his labor power to his different needs is its precondition. But this apportioning in societies which have outgrown the primitive stage where labor takes place within everybody's sight demands some formal commensuration of the socially necessary varieties of labor. Some sort of commensuration of labor then becomes a necessity for every kind of society, societies of appropriation and societies of production alike. Marx makes this very clear in Grand Race with obvious forethought of socialism. On the basis of communal production, the determination of time remains of course essential. The less time the society, 
requires to produce wheat, cattle, etc. <clears throat> the more time it wins for either production, material, or mental. Just as in the case of an individual, the multiplicity of its development, its enjoyment, and its activity depends on economization of time. Economy of time, to this all, economy ultimately reduces itself. Society likewise has to distribute its time in a purposeful way in order to achieve a production adequate to its overall needs. Thus, economy of time, along with the planned distribution of labor time among the various branches of production, remains the first economic law on the basis of communal production. It becomes law there to an even higher degree. However, this is essentially different from the measurement of exchange values, labor or products, by labor time. The labor of individuals in the same branch of work and the various kinds of work are different from one another, not only quantitatively, but also qualitatively. What does a solely quantitative difference between things presuppose? The identity of their qualities. Hence, the quantitative measure of labor presupposes the equivalence, the identity of their quality. Thus, the commensuration of labor demanded by way of a law of nature for any human society presupposes a quantification of labor of different kinds or by different individuals. And the fact is that labor, as it occurs in society, is not of itself quantifiable. It is not directly quantifiable in terms of needs, nor needs in terms of labor. Neither is labor quantifiable in terms of labor time unless the labor were identical in kind, or the actual differences, material or personal, were disregarded. Therefore, to satisfy the law of nature, stated by Marx, thereby making human society possible, systems of social economy are needed to operate a commensuration of labor based on a quantification of labor. As Marx suggests, both the commensuration and the quantification of labor can be brought about in different ways, and these differences should be taken into account in distinguishing social formations and their economic systems. A most significant difference in the modes of commensuration of labor rests upon whether it is brought about indirectly by the exchange process or directly by the labor process. The exchange process here stands for the, partic the particular form of societization on the basis of commodity production. The whole secret and difficulty of Marx's analysis of the commodity and of exchange in the opening chapters of Capital lies in the task he sets himself of explaining how the exchange process brings about a social commensuration of labor in the guise of commodity value and of money. The abstractification of labor makes for its quantification as the hidden determinant of the exchange proportions of the commodities he declares to be the crucial point, the pivotal point, for an understanding of political economy. By equating their different products to each other in exchange as values, they equate their different kinds of labor as human labor. They do this without being aware of it. To sum up, we can enumerate five characteristics of the commensuration of labor underlying commodity production in accordance with Marxian teaching. One, it takes place in exchange and by the valorization of money and capital. Two, it takes place indirectly. Three, it takes place in an unconscious manner. Four, it takes place as an outcome of the whole circuit of the social exchange process. And five, above all, it applies to the labor stored or embodied in the commodities, or as Marx calls it, to dead labor. The fourth of these characteristics emphasizes that in effecting the commensuration of labor, commodity exchange provides the social nexus and that the social nexus operates the commensuration of labor. Marx stresses this, but only as the economic implication of the law of value. My analysis widens the implication to embrace the formation of the abstract intellect. This extension does not, of course, in the least invalidate the Marxian analysis, but merely complements it. While Marx exposes the economics of the capitalist class antagonism, which is unhinged if the private property rights of capital are abolished, I focus on the division of mental and manual labor, which is another aspect of the same class antagonism. Um, however, this aspect of the antagonism does not disappear by the abolition of private property 
or private capital, but will have to be consciously liquidated in the progress of socialist construction as a measuring rod of its success. This has never been taken into account in the Soviet Union except in the words, whereas it forms a central issue in the construction of socialism in China since the victory of the proletarian cultural revolution. Chapter 32 the commensuration of labor in action. We must now return to Frederick Winslow Taylor and focus upon his method of accurate and scientific study of unit times, declared to be by far the most important element in scientific management. His analysis was done in the service of capital and therefore as a method for speeding labor. Under our viewpoint, however, the method need not serve this objective nor be wielded by capital as a means by enforcing its control over labor. It could even be a method operated by the workers themselves, although then it would certainly differ substantially from Taylorism. But in order to have a firm base for our own considerations, we take as a starting point the way in which it is practiced in monopoly capitalist mass production. Taylor's aims in analyzing manual operations were, in the first place, to find out how the studied operation can be done with least waste of time and minimal effort and fatigue, then to norm the operation as a composite of strictly repetitive and standard parts, to reduce these parts to the smallest particles or units of motion, assumed to be homogeneous in all manual operations, to time these units with the precision of fractions of a second Finally, to use these unit times as a foundation of the job evaluation for fixing correct wage and bonus rates. Some of these features have undergone more or less considerable modifications since the days of Taylor. Modifications, however, which mainly serve to make Taylorism more acceptable to the workers, to sell it to them. These are of lesser importance from our point of view. It still is a method of direct time and motion study or better, of job analysis allowing for the possibility that the job in question could be a collective performance of a highly automated workshop or of a section of it as it is in the measured day rate system of management. Our interest lies in the fact that here operations of different qualitative description are being expressed as different multiples of each other in quantitative terms of labor time. We have, in other words, a systematic quantification on standards of uniform time measures, and thus a commensuration of labor in the literal meaning of it, over a range of operations. Since Taylor's time, these operations have expanded to one industry after another, and even to agriculture, mining, transportation, and many of the service industries, as well as to administration, to clerical work and design. If we compare this mode of commensurating labor with the one affected by the social change process as analyzed by Marx, it becomes obvious at a glance that both are diametrical opposites to each other in every vital characteristic. The mode initiated by Taylor is, one, rooted in the labor process of production, two, it is a direct form of quantification, three, it is carried out consciously with the aim of quantification in mind, Four, it is performed for single, particular jobs, each analyzed in strict isolation, building up in stages to sectional parts into the entirety of existing or even of projected labor processes. And five, most important of all, it applies to labor in action in contrast to dead labor stored in commodities. However, an essential reservation must be made in speaking of a system of commensuration of labor of any kind. It must have a character of, ca of causal reality in practice, and not be merely a calculation existing somewhere on paper. The commensuration of dead labor is given causal reality by the actual performance of acts of exchange. Only by the reality of these acts is it actually carried out and takes shape as the economic laws governing a social system of commodity production, whether capitalist or pre-capitalist. Thus, the element of reality in time and space is an indispensable attribute to labor commensuration. In the case of labor in action, the step from its mere existence on paper to its existence for society rests in putting the calculation into reality in an actual process of flow production. 
Only by a conveyor belt in motion does the calculated proportion of labor which it enforces on the workers assume the functional reality of social labor commensuration. Remembering Ford's first installation of flow production when no preliminary time studies had been made, a commensuration of these jobs nevertheless entered into force with no previous calculations. We must, of course, remember that the time standards of labor commensuration vary from factory to factory. Corresponding to their degree of competitiveness and even vary within the same factory where the speed of operations is changed at frequent intervals. These different standards set the framework for the production process among monopoly capitalists who, on the one hand, associate to manipulate the markets and on the other work in fierce competition. They must therefore operate the dynamics of their monopolistic economy of production within a framework of market economy to make it fit into a system of social synthesis. Chapter 33, the way to automation. We have seen how the economy of time not only forces every firm to aim at the uninterrupted continuity of its production process, but also to apply the highest possible speed and the greatest economy in the use of constant capital. Competitiveness demands the quickest capital turnover, and this again adds to the pressure for speed of operations. As a result, there is a shortening cycle of renewal of plant at a rising level of technology and increased cost, thereby the proportion of the circulating part of the capital relative to the fixed part tends continuously to rise. Since it is only the circulating part of the productive capital, which carries surplus value, the tendency helps to countervail the trend towards a falling rate of profit. In short, the, the cumulative pressures of the monopolistic economy of time devolve upon the workforce by an ever-increasing speed of operations. Even before the Second World War, this speeding had in some cases reached the degree where it surpassed the limits of human capability, and technological agencies were introduced to obtain the required results. One of the first of these, to my knowledge, was the photoelectric cell, or electric eye, whose action replaces the replaces and exceeds the attention possible by a human person. There's hardly any need to remind ourselves of the stress Marx lays upon this element of human work. Apart from the exertion of the working bodily organs, a purposeful will is required for the entire duration of the work. This means close attention. To give an example, in the early 1930s, the manufacture of razor blades was transformed in Germany from the operations of small-scale cutlers to automated mass production by large-scale mechanisms relying on photoelectric cells for retaining the flawless blades and rejecting failures at a rate and reliability completely unattainable by a human operator. The Hollerith machine, also based on an electric eye, was in use for office work very much earlier. High speed and mass production was only made possible by the introduction of such technological agencies in place of human labor power. From the 1950s onwards, the use has been enormously extended, tending to make for complete automation of an increasing range of manufacturing processes. I believe that the essential aspect of this type of automation is ultimately the total replacement of the subjectivity of a human labor power. By this, I mean the entirety of the human person's mental and sensorial activities in the particular jobs of work involved. Details of this replacement have been so frequently and lavishly described that we can spare ourselves the tedium of renewed repetition. It serves our purpose better to quote a very apt, though ironical passage by Robert Bogoslaw. Our immediate concern, let us remember, is the explication of the operating unit approach to system design. No matter what materials are used, we must take care to prevent this discussion from degenerating into a single-sided analysis of the complex characteristics of one type of system material, namely human beings. What we need is an inventory of the ways in which human behavior can be controlled and a description of some instruments that will help us achieve control. If this provides us sufficient handles on human materials so that we can think of them as one thinks of metal parts, electric power, or chemical reactions, then we have succeeded in placing human materials on the same footing as any other materials 
and, groups, and can proceed with our problems of system design. Once we have equated, um, once we have equated all possible materials, one simply checks the catalog for the price, operating characteristics, and reliability of this material, and plugs it in where indicated. There are, however, many disadvantages in the use of human operating units. They are somewhat fragile. They are subject to fatigue, obsolescence, disease, and death. They are frequently stupid, unreliable, and limited in memory capacity. But beyond all this, they sometimes seek to design their own system circuitry. This, in a material, in a material is unforgivable. Any system utilizing them must devise appropriate safeguards. What is here described by way of a persiflage, but not far wrong from the true reality, denotes the whole line of monopolistic development of the labor process leading up to automation. A great deal a great deal more automation could be introduced in the capitalist world than is in fact carried out. The reason for holding back is not only the excessive cost and rise of overheads attending automation <clears throat> in many cases, but the fact that the extension of automation beyond certain limits is bound to defeat the very end of the whole process, which is to maximize profits. It is easier and safer for monopoly capital to scan the world for cheap and willing labor still available for exploitation. To develop the full potentialities of automation will probably be a task remaining for socialism.